The subject of this week's episode was recommended to me by Jay Wright, the president of the Foothills Writers Guild in Anderson, South Carolina. It's the story of a man who's become something of a modern tall tale, like Johnny Appleseed, Paul Bunyan, or Pecos Bill. It's the story of Chess McCartney, the Goat Man. Chess earned the title of Goat Man by spending four decades on the road, traveling in a goat-drawn wagon. From the 1930s to the 1960s, he visited many small towns across the Midwest and South. Chess was made to be a legend. His strange way of traveling and larger-than-life personality made an impression on anyone who saw him. Before Jay emailed me, I'd never heard of the Goat Man, so the first thing I did was to call Jay and hear his story. Hi, this is uh, Luke Boserman. I'm calling for Jay. Yes, we have a bad connection, but Jay's right here. He might want to call you back. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi, Jay. This is Luke. How are you? Jay told me he'd seen the Goat Man as a child, and about 20 years ago, had found out more about this strange character. We'll see what happened. About 20 years ago, I've got a baby sister who lives in North Georgia. And we were just sitting around talking one day, and she said, um, I gotta get home. She said, I need to clean up my house. Looks like a goat man lived there. And I had not heard that word in years. And I started laughing. I said, What in the world made you think of that? Because she was absolutely a baby when he used to come through. So, so when you were growing up, did you, uh, you saw him come through town then? You were old enough to remember. Yeah. It, uh, it was probably, uh, he might have skipped a year or something, or he maybe went a different route. I don't know what, but I can remember either five or six times between when I was maybe five and 15 that he came through. He always came up Highway 27, and it was just the biggest deal going for kids and a lot of adults. I mean, people would hear about him and just literally go get in their car and drive to wherever they heard he was. And, uh, you know, people would bring him food and, and uh, sit out there with him. And he'd always he'd pick up junk on the side of the road and turn right around and sell it to people and make money with it. You know, he was, he was almost like a recycler. Well, I <laughs> saw in that, uh, that piece that you sent me that he would sell postcards for 25 cents each or three for a dollar. Yeah. And, and and people just they would look they look for reasons to give him money. All of us lived sort of in that neighborhood, but across the street from my grandmother, and down about two houses, there was nothing. It was just an old field, and with a railroad track behind it. He would always spend the night there. Uh, when he would come, he'd get out there and burn a damn old tire. He'd pick up tires on the side of the road, but he'd, he'd bring a tire out there and set that thing on fire. And it smoke you could see smoke all over the place. People see it see that smoke coming and they'd say there he is you know and he'd, he'd, he'd draw a crowd with that because he'd get money from them if, if they didn't if they hadn't heard because not everybody had a phone and people everybody had a party line but not everybody knew that he was there but they'd see that smoke and say well either something's on fire or the goat man's here and they go get their car and you know there was nothing better to do some people didn't even have television so they'd go over there and sit down with him and you know pretty soon he'd start preaching now, i never heard him preach he he always everything he talked about was something about God and going to heaven and everything else. But he didn't he wasn't preaching. He wasn't actually preaching the sermon. They said that you know when things kind of settled down, he'd just start preaching. If off his on a Sunday, now I never saw him there on a Sunday. But if you sit around and shoot the bull with him, we weren't allowed to do anything like that. But uh, if you did, uh, they said you know he'd sit out there with the men folks and. They'd get out there and get talking, and next thing you know, he'd be preaching and pass a hat and everything else, and they'd just have a regular old, uh, basically almost like a camp meeting kind of a thing. He didn't hold back cussing right in the middle of a prayer. <laughs> he'd get worked up, and <laughs> there were some people that didn't appreciate his language that uh, couldn't get into the religious aspect of it because of his language. <laughs> He seems an unusual sort. I'm not kidding you. Now, do you remember that, the smell too? I've read about that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's uh, that's uh, that that as much as anything because it. I I don't know that he bathed. I think what happened was 
he just got rained on, and he would just be hot and sweaty. Then all those goats on top of it. And he slept with them. He actually slept with them. They would. He kept the little ones up in the up in his wagon, and uh, there was a little place back there. And they didn't just sleep there; they actually birthed little goats there. If he had one pregnant, he'd, you know, if they didn't, if they, I guess if he could, he'd put them up there. But it was just sort of a, it was just like a barn inside his wagon. He had a lot of junk and stuff. You've seen that in the pictures, but but really, you could be standing there. You know, we always wanted to. You know, shake his hand or just say hello or speak to him or something like that. But oh man, he, he there was no different between the way he smelled and the way goat smelled. Jay wasn't the only subscriber to the Weekly Holler who remembers the Goat Man. Linda DeWitt saw him in Morganton, North Carolina, when she was ten years old. What I remember about him was uh, uh, it was a very dirty situation, you know, because I guess he never had a bath and all this kind of stuff. And uh, what, what left the impression with me was the goats that had walked until they were walking on, they had no hooves left, and they were just walking on the bloody leg, you know, on their bones, I guess. Even as a child, that seemed terribly cruel to me. I grew up on a farm. And we treated our animals better than that, you know. Uh, there was a lot of fanfare in the town, you know. It okay. didn't take much to entertain us. <laughs> and my mama had heard it on the radio. And so it was a big thing, you know, that he was going to be coming down a certain road on that day. And so uh, people were going out to see him, kind of like a circus coming to town or something like that. There were others who had an altogether different idea about the nature of the goat man. I remember my dad telling me the goat man was coming. And I think that one must have been the first time. And I don't remember how old it was, but it was scary. The goat man is coming. It's it like to scare me to death. That was Jim Broom speaking. When he first heard of the goat man, he was convinced that it was a monster like the boogeyman. That impression didn't last very long, though. He wasn't bad at all. Just smell bad. You know, I, I remember seeing him coming down the road, and if the goats that were pulling the wagon, it was eight or ten or whatever of them, and they were pulling the wagon, and if they were struggling a little bit, then he would talk to these goats that were in the rear, and they were usually the bigger billy goats with the bigger horns, and they actually put their head against the back of that wagon and pushed. I said, Lord have mercy. He's, he's got pullers and pushers. So just who was Chess McCartney? I wanted to know more about the man behind the legend. It turns out that the goat man was from Sigourney, Iowa. From an early age, he had a sense of adventure. When he was 14 years old, he ran away to New York City and married a Spanish knife thrower 10 years his senior. During the Depression, Chess lost his farm in Iowa and went to work cutting down trees for the WPA. One day, a tree fell on him, breaking many bones on the left side of his body and pinning him to the ground. According to Chess, a search party found him several hours later and, presuming him dead, took his body to the local funeral home. As the undertaker prepared to embalm him, he regained consciousness. The accident left him with a crippled left arm. Unable to return to work and unwilling to go on government assistance, Chess decided to take to the road in a goat-drawn cart. He even had his wife sew some goat-skin clothes for him and their son, a fashion statement inspired by his favorite book outside the Bible, Robinson Crusoe. Traveling at a pace of one mile an hour, news of the goat man's arrival had plenty of time to spread before he actually made it to the next town on his route. Local newspapers and radio stations ran stories about him. Chess eventually started an actual church in Jeffersonville, Georgia, the Free Thinking Christian Mission. Renowned author Flannery O'Connor saw the goat man on multiple occasions and even mentioned him in a letter to a friend. When we were somewhere above Conyers, Georgia, we saw up ahead a pile of rubble some eight feet high on the side of the road. When we got about 50 feet from it, 
we could begin to make out that some of the rubble was distributed around something like a cart, and that some of it was alive. Then we began to make out the goats. We stopped in front of it and looked back. About half the goats were asleep, venerable and exhausted, in kind of a heap. I didn't see chess. Then my mother located an arm around the neck of one of the goats. We also saw a knee. The old man was lying on the road, asleep amongst them, but we never located his face. Many literary experts have pointed to Chess McCartney and his son as the inspiration behind some of O'Connor's most famous characters. The backwoods preacher Mason Tarwater and his great nephew Francis in the violent Bear It Away. Cormac McCarthy's novel Sutri also has a character based on the goat man. But Chess McCartney didn't inspire Southern Gothic authors alone. One young boy who saw him changed his career plans. The boy's father owned a store that the goat man visited to buy a new pair of overalls. The boy was horrified by the goat man's smell, which lingered in the dressing room for days after he left. But even more than that, the boy was disturbed by the state of the goat man's teeth. He later credited seeing the goat man's teeth with his decision to become a dentist instead of running his father's store. The goat man's traveling days came to an end due to a tragic incident on Signal Mountain outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, when he was attacked late one night. He was injured and eight of his goats were killed. He retired to Jeffersonville where he and his son lived in an old school bus. He eventually entered a rest home where he passed away in 1998. I hope you enjoyed this story. For more like it, head on over to theweeklyholler.com and sign up for our free email newsletter. You can also find The Weekly Holler on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter.